Anyway, hello boys and girls, cats and dogs. We are an inclusive channel here. Hello. Except for the cats part. We like we prefer dogs. <laughs> but still, um, we have Fiber Spider with us. How hello. cool is that? It doesn't get much cooler than Fiber Spider. And well, I, I mean, I've been on your channel a bunch of times in your, your live stream. That's true when I've done live streams, yes. And I think you were there for my very first live stream. Not she sure, but I think been. I think well, so, yeah. It's hard to keep track because you do so many of them. That's because I love to do them. Well, that's fine. It's just it's hard for me to keep track, that's all. Well, you don't have to. Well, I have limited brain power. I mean, bear with me, please. <laughs> you said bear. <laughs> Point taken. Any, anyway, um, um, so yeah, yeah, Craig is here with us. Um, and um, I'm going to make him uncomfortable for a second. Craig was one of the very first people I started following on YouTube when I picked up the hook. And that was five or six years ago after having learned as a child, but I just picked it up again about five or six years ago. And he was one of the first people I started following on YouTube. And then, mm, what was it? Eight or 10 months ago, I won a giveaway on your channel. And mm -hmm. then we started communicating and just hit it off because we love to talk to each other because <laughs> we're both nerds. We hit it off. <laughs> yeah because it's it's fun um so uh, i'm sure you've i'm sure i'm sure you stop it <laughs> i'm sure you've seen <laughs> don't, what, give me that do? face. Do? don't make me pull this car over before we've even started <laughs> but um i'm sure you've seen some of my other interviews i always start out with general questions and then we go where the spirit moves us go um so well, what, what would you like people to know about you? Um, I, I imagine someone has never seen you before, which I cannot imagine myself, but um, well, how would you introduce yourself? Let me see. Uh, I'm about five foot eight, weight undisclosed. I like long walks on the beach. Um, <laughs> Perhaps you have a different context in mind here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, um, no, I, uh, well, let me see. Uh, I have been stitching, uh, crocheting, knitting, uh, what have you for, you know, roughly 20 something years, um, mostly self-taught. Uh, a lot of books, a lot of YouTube, a lot of experimentation, um, and uh, it started off with crocheting. Then I wanted to, you know, expand my horizons, so I, I went into knitting, um, <clears throat> and um, you know, I've also expanded into weaving and spinning of yarn and a little bit of sewing. I, I like fiber arts in general. Um, anything to do with, you know, making something from nothing, even, you know, embroidery or um, counted cross stitch. The idea of making something from nothing or uh, embellishing something, um, I just, I've always been fascinated with it. And it's, for me, it's it's really a win-win on so many levels because it's a way for me to express myself and to be not just productive, but also creative. And also the items, not always, but a lot of the time, it's not just uh, pretty, but it's also practical. You know, I mean, if you're wearing something that you've crocheted, it could be pretty. It could also be practical. It could be both. Sometimes it's more of a decorative ornamental type thing that you're wearing. Um, but quite often, no, it has a purpose. And I really like that. Uh, I'm not so much into creating, for lack of a better word, tchotchke-esque ornamentation, you know, very ornamental things. I do like things to have more of a purpose to them. That's why I don't do... Uh, 
knickknack type things for the most part, which there's nothing wrong with those because they give us a psychological comfort. And that, that has a value to it as well. But I'm more into the utilitarian type aspect of crafting, if you will. Exactly. Some people do crochet jewelry or crochet Christmas ornaments. Sure. Um, and I have not done that yet. And I don't know that I will because there are so many other things that I want to do first. No, but I mean, the thing is, in some ways, it's like, no, they're not necessarily utilitarian, useful, that sort of thing. But psychologically, they have a use because they make us happy. And that I've always therefore said, they... Yeah, yeah, I've always said that about beauty. Beauty yeah. is there for us. Right. Whatever I mean, is beautiful, a, yeah. A painting on your wall, it doesn't really have a purpose, but to our psyche... It has a purpose. It does. It does have a purpose. You know. I... Puppy dogs. There you go. Have a purpose. And I, I can't get enough of them. Which should surprise nobody who knows me. <laughs> but um, um, even though I don't have a living and breathing dog yet, it still that might happen soon, but um so yeah exactly so then um are you like most of us who learned as a as a kid and then put it down and then picked it up again no you've always done it i didn't start until i was i want to say maybe 20 21 oh then just last year <laughs> uh no i'm 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 in my forties. Um, and uh, no, I actually, uh, I have told this story before uh, on my own channel a, a couple times, um, but actually how I got started was, now typically I'm not a fan of reality TV. Uh, I think a lot of it is scripted and it's- I think it's a contradiction of terms. Mm -hmm. uh, generally I'm just, I am not a fan. And this, however, for me, it was the exception to the rule. There was a series of reality shows on, I wanna say it was BBC, PBS, something along those lines. And one of them, it was called 1940s House. And it was- Is, at, Was that the his, historical- uh... Historian series where there's like a different mini series. Mm -hmm. Oh, I've seen those. I love. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry. It was it was intelligent. It was thought provoking because they took a contemporary, you know, modern family, you know, and they basically put them into a house that was the 1940s, where all of the furniture, oh, the accoutrements, everything, okay. the food everything was 1940s they had to black out their windows because this was in in england in wartime yeah during the blitz so they had to black out their windows at night they had to deal with food rations they had to do volunteer work for the war effort and um part of it was you know you had these two two women it was basically a uh mother of two little boys and her parents all living together in the same house. Now, it was really the uh, the patriarch, the the mother of two boys. Her father, he was like a 1940s aficionado, and uh, he was all about it. And the others were pretty much along for the ride. And they didn't have, they didn't quite have the the skill set that was needed back then. They're used to using the microwave and, and so on and so forth. And all of a sudden, oh, they have to cook and they have to clean and they have to do all these things without modern day conveniences. Um, and it, it took its toll. They, they did a very good job, all things considered. I think they did it for about six weeks. And part of it was, uh, I saw them, they were crocheting and knitting and so forth for the war effort you know, making granny square, you know, blankets. And I'm like, 
oh heck, if if they can do it, I can do it. Mm -hmm. And I had an interest in uh, crocheting prior to that, but that for me, that was really, I would say the, the impetus that got me started. And the rest is the history, if you will. And at that time, YouTube was really not a thing. Uh, tutorials on YouTube really wasn't a thing at that point. This was, I want to say, late 90s. So things were still in their infancy as far as being able to find tutorials on YouTube. So for me, books, 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 lots of books. Uh, well, you and, and books go way back too. So, yeah. And so, I mean, that, that was one of the primary ways in which I learned, but also a lot of experimentation um, because there's only so much information that you can get from books. You know, the idea of, you know, yarn weight and tension and gauge and that sort of thing. A lot of it's really personal experience. Um, also and trial and error experience as far as what works with color and what doesn't work with color with certain stitches and so forth that that comes with time exactly exactly now i realize now i had a different bbc um series in mind when you first brought it up but i think you would love it um where these historians go back in time and do an entire year and um, the one that i thought of was called a wartime Farm or something. The first one that I saw them do was a, a Tudor monastery farm. It's always a farm. Uh, so they did a year um, on a farm in Tudor times, um, a farm that basically belonged to a monastery and they were tenant farmers. So they, while I, and there were all of these rules and regulations about what they could and couldn't do in their in, in their surroundings, but it was absolutely fascinating. But they also did one about a farm in the south of England. Um, I don't know the counties, but uh, during the war, and that also was fascinating. Everything that they had to do to get by during wartime, because there were the hardships and um, also the um, intrigue. And um, there are people who t carried secrets to their deaths um, who were involved in a lot of stuff for the war back then that they just well, never I mean, spoke even about. Knitters were spies. Exactly. Well, yeah, there's, there's the famous um, uh, concept of knitting communications into a pattern. Oh. Yeah. Yep. That's, I think that's fascinating. So do I, you know, like putting Morse code into your knitting to mm -hmm. deliver a message. It's like, oh no, this is a scarf, really. <laughs> no, but you and, you and I both love language and that kind oh, yeah. of stuff and knowledge and that kind of stuff. We're sort of hoarders of knowledge in our own ways. And etymology and that sort of mm -hmm. thing. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, that, that, so that's what got you started. That's, that's yeah. where we, this tangent began. Um, Sorry. And then uh, that's what, that's what I do. I do tangents um, because that's I, I what like makes conversation <laughs> fun. I'm sorry. I like tan grams. I like tangerines. But <laughs> I just, I, I don't get a tan, I burn. Oh, please. Yeah, I used to say I, I have two colors, white and pink. Um, but also, since I've grown older, I've, I've realized I'm more likely to die with skin cancer than of skin cancer. Um, but that's, that's how it is. I, I'm not as afraid of the sun as I used to be. But look, back to you. Stop me when I do that, because I, I do turn things around to myself <laughs> okay, but all there, the there's, time. But okay, you're here and I'm here and we're here. Therefore, it's not a one-way street, so. That's, that's true, but you know, people come here, they, they know me already and they want to know you better. Well, 
a lot of people that are watching this probably already know who I am. And they're like, yes, he's telling this story again. <laughs> but I haven't really, I had not heard that story before. Well, now you did. I did, indeed. There you go. Indeed. And because, I mean, people might not know, but we, we talk all the time offline and have shared stories. But, um, okay, then. And, and you are talking about spreading out into knitting and spinning. And I have a uh, hank of yarn that was a gift. I think it was a, a giveaway um, prize from you that you mm -hmm. spun yourself that I'm afraid to touch because uh, I think if I dye it uh, and make a mistake, it will be completely ruined. And it's just it, so precious. It would be unique. It would yeah. be unique. So, um, well, some, one of the things that I do say fairly often is never let fear dictate your actions. I'm 58 years old. Fear has dictated my life. <laughs> okay, well, you do you, boo. But I know. You know, when, it, when it comes to creative activities, okay, mm -hmm. I'm not saying, you know, should I or shouldn't I, you know, jump out of this airplane for recreational purposes? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying when it comes to, you know, what we do as as stitchers it's like no don't be afraid to take a chance because there is so much that i would not have done if i let my fear do the talking for me um i never would have started knitting i never would have started youtube initially i was terrified of the idea of doing a youtube channel absolutely terrified you know, but just total true. Mm -hmm. um, initially, I did not want to show my face. I didn't want to speak. I just wanted to show my hands and have little subtitles at the bottom of what you're supposed to do. You know, I, I would do the same sort of camera shot that I do on most of my tutorials where you just see my hands. Mm -hmm. And but no, I would just, I wouldn't say anything. I would just have the little little words at the bottom of the screen uh, saying what it is that you're supposed to do. Um, and I've seen a bunch of tutorials like that. And that's what I was initially thinking of doing when I started my channel. And I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm just going to go for broke and I'm actually going to speak. Um, because that's my voice, my voice has been a sore spot with me uh, for most of my life. Um, I know what you mean. When I was in uh, 10th grade, my voice still hadn't changed. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. So you can imagine the delight of my, you know, peers uh, at trying to prod me into speaking so they could make fun of my voice. So I didn't say much when I was in high school. Um, my, my voice was very high pitched. Um, and then finally it cracked, it changed, you know. Um, and when you were so, 23 or something, <laughs> that was a joke. 10th grade in high school, I was like 16 at the time. Yeah. Um, but I was suggesting that it finally changed when you were 23. No, at that it time. It was a joke that came. fell flat, so we can just move on. Pardon? <laughs> I said it was a joke that fell flat, so we That's can okay. just move on. So the thing is, is that, you know, my, my voice has always been sort of like a sensitive spot for me. And I mean, even to this day, when I'm on the phone, sometimes somebody will say, you know, they'll call me miss uh, or no. ma'am. Exactly. And to this day, and yeah, it's, it's, it, it's a point of contention with me, you know, but you know, that such is life. Uh, but uh, so yeah, I, initially I was thinking of not speaking at all uh, on my channel. And then I just decided to bite the bullet and just do it. And then, uh, for one of my projects, it was a, a shawl project. I think it was the Wrap Yourself in Love 
shawl, which had sort of an unconventional shape to it. It wasn't strictly a triangular shape. So I felt that it needed to be modeled and I didn't have anybody to model it except myself. So uh, again, I bit the bullet and I'm like, you know what? All right, fine. If I'm going to do this, you know, if I'm going to work it, I'm going to work it. I'm going to strut my stuff. And I remember doing the twirl and sort of like the little catwalk thing for the intro. And uh, I felt totally out of my comfort zone. Um, but I decided, you know what, I'm just going to do it. And I think that might have been the first time that I actually showed my face on camera. Um, and again, that's not something that I was 100% confident in doing, but I did yeah. it. Um, so it, this really long protracted tangent of my own is basically saying, I let go of the fear. You know, I could have done this channel completely different than how I did it. And it might not be what it is today if I had gone that route. Um, not showing my face, not saying any words, uh, basically out of fear, just hiding behind the camera and not showing my face and et cetera, et cetera. But I decided, you know, I'm going to do this. And I didn't let fear dictate my actions and I went with it. So that that is essentially what I'm getting at where if you let fear dictate your actions, it's gonna hold you back. So as far as your wool, again, this is what this whole thing started with. As far as your wool, take a chance. There's, there's more wool to be had. Sheep have not gone extinct, okay? It's, it's okay. Try it. You might like it. I totally get you. Uh, uh, even now, I'm thinking, you used to wear hats all the time, and now you don't so much. Uh, it's a little warm. Well, well, you know what I mean. It might have been a baseball yes. cap or something. And now you don't wear I hats as much. I haven't worn a much. baseball cap in, like, 20-plus years. That was an example. But you used to wear caps, um, beanies. Fedoras, would, would, would this, if you would will. this suffice? Would this make you? I'm happy? not telling you I want to see you in a hat, but it's just an observation that you wear hats less frequently now than you used to. Only because we it, it's getting hot. Um, I mean, during during the winter time, uh, I don't use the heat much. Really, um, really. Well, I mean, I I'm, I don't I'm, freeze. I don't freeze, but uh, we, we keep the heat pretty low. So usually I wear, you know, a, a sweater and a hat all the time indoors. But right now, no, it, it's plenty warm. You know, I mean, usually I wear a, a hoodie, but no, I, I no need for that right now. Yeah, uh, when I was in New York, most of the time I had steam heat and the last five or more years, no longer than that uh, I, I was I had steam heat and on the fifth floor in a, in a co-op so we never suffered for heat um, so with with steam heat that's just the way steam heat works uh, and now in coastal North Carolina it does get chilly um, and it has been known to snow here and we get some icy rain in the winter but um, we have heat in the house. So, uh, I'm God knows we have air conditioning. My sister keeps it like a fridge in here. <laughs> but, um, anyway, yeah. And you were talking about doing the voice and the hands only. Are you familiar with the cooking channel Food Wishes? Um, the guy who does that, his name is Chef John. I don't remember his last name, but he's just known as Chef John. He started out for many years just doing the hands and the bowl and whatever he was doing. And it was good stuff. It was funny because he had a great sense of humor and I learned a lot. And then it's only in the past couple of years that we see his face more and more and more. Um, and it's, it, 
for everyone, it's an evolution. And yeah. um, so, so you well, started. Actually, there, is, there is a YouTuber though. Um, it's uh, Steady Crafton, or I think, he, well, he refers to himself as the, the, the craftsman. And, but I think the, the channel name is Steady Crafton. Mm -hmm. And he's cool. He's very cool. Now it's not knitting or crocheting or anything like that. Um, it's more along the lines of uh, technology based DIYs or uh, he's a big fan of action figures and um, figurines and how mm -hmm. to create them with molds and et cetera, et cetera. Now the thing is, is that with him, uh, you, I've never seen his face. He has a Muppet. Really? That, that he has a Muppet that he talks through. And it, it's hysterical. You know, that is a pretty like, darn cute thing. So you just, you, you just see this Muppet and you go, hey everybody, it's the craftsman with steady crafting. And uh, it's hysterical and it's really well done. Believe it or not, it's really, really well done. And when he's doing his tutorials, he's wearing fuzzy gloves usually because it's a, he's a Muppet, right? And I have never seen his actual non-gloved hands before. Really? He always wear gloves. Once he took off his gloves and he was wearing a pair of gloves underneath the gloves. It's just, yeah. He's, oh, he's I think awesome. that's cute. It, it is. sounds like he's put a lot of thought into that. Yes. The, the way it works. So then, well, we know you've had your channel for quite some time. Did it take I you say maybe five years, roughly? Probably. I know you were already established when I found you, which would have been about five years ago. But, um, do you think it took you some time to find your voice? If you know what I mean, what, what makes you, you, your unique selling proposition in the business world? Mm, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I've, I've enjoyed stitching for, you know, a couple decades now. Um, and I have taught in person before, and that's that's hard. I'll be the first to say it. That is difficult. I've done it, but it's not easy. You told um, me some stories about that, you know. You know, because the thing is, is that everybody learns differently. And everybody, I believe that everybody has the capacity to learn but it's how each person learns because some people they're better with pictures. Some people they're better with written words, some people with video, some people with audio, everybody processes information differently. Okay. Exactly. Not everybody realizes that, but it's true. Oh, it's very true. Uh, me, I mean, I would say that I learned best through visual like like video um uh and, and that and repetition that's how i learn best through repetition and that's why i like doing what i do so much because it's pretty much all repetition to an extent you know i mean you have a pattern you have a repeat you have repetition exactly exactly so, yeah. um, but as far as finding my voice um or what have you um, I don't know. I mean, I think it stems from my initial sort of mission statement, if you will. And that's on my about, uh, section of my channel, which is I'm about the three E's. Enlighten, educate, and entertain. And it's about the three E's. Um, I like those three E's. Thank you. Uh, and that's why for me, it's not just one thing. It's not 
just crocheting. It's not just knitting. It's not just audiobook narrations or product reviews. It's a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of the other. Um, I didn't want to pigeonhole myself into one particular area. Um, granted, if I did, I might be better at one particular area, but I also kind of like the idea of being a jack of all trades, master of none, because you have more variety that way. I don't think anyone has any complaints about um, any of the specific areas that you approach. You because, haven't seen the comments I have. <laughs> well, there are going to be those people everywhere for everyone. Well, and you can't. You can't please everybody, and if you try to please everybody, the last person you're going to please is yourself. Yeah. Um, and I've I've come to grips with that, but you know, as far as the three E's, you know, uh, are concerned, it's like I love books. Uh, that that's not a big shocker. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I I love books. I love to read, and um, I wanted to have the audiobook narratives as a part of my channel for several reasons. Um, one reason is that one of the things that I do upon occasion is while I'm stitching, I will listen to an audiobook. That way I can multitask. I can do more than one thing at the same time. I can read a book and get work up on a blanket done at the same time. It's a mm -hmm. fabulous thing because I can't, my, my, my eyes have to be on my project. I'm not one exactly, of those yeah. people that they, you know, they can look straight ahead and they're stitching like this. And I'm like, no, no, I need to see what I'm doing. You know, I, that, that's just me. Um, so the idea of doing the narrations for me, that was a way of introducing people to classical literature that they might not be familiar with, that they may or may not enjoy. You don't know until you try. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, using that also, not just to introduce people to classical literature and the idea of, oh yeah, I can listen to this while I'm stitching. But also for me, it was a tactical move, I, I admit, because if I did as many videos as I do, but they were all crocheting, I would burn my little self out fast. If I did three crocheting tutorials a week, I would burn How myself out. How could you out. possibly do that? Three I tutorials used to do, a week. Back in the day, I believe I used to do two per week. I can't manage one a week. It's hard. That's yeah. Tough. Yeah, it's, at it's, one point, I think I was doing um, like five to seven videos a week on my main channel. Speaking of which, you do have a secondary channel, which is all about gaming. True. Too. And, you know, gaming is a little bit foreign to me, but I know that you love it. Oh, yeah. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's a great it's a great catharsis, really. It's a way of, you know, being somebody else, doing something else. Um, but as far as just before before the gaming tangent, um, you know, as far as the the audiobooks, it's a way for me to post as much as I do, um, you know, the, the audiobook narrations, they can take quite a while to get finished as far as the recording goes, because I flub a lot and I have to, you know, take 10, take 15, take 20, I, you know, some of the, some of the verbiage that is used in some of the classic literature, I, I know. they are not I words know. that are used today. I did the Ballad of Reading Jail, and I've got the love song of jail for Prufrock um, uh, uh, um, staring me in the face right now because I want to tackle that as well. So, so you yeah, know what I, I mean? Exactly. It's not I mean, easy. The, the Ballad of Reading Jail was five installments for one poem. Yeah, yeah. So the thing is, is that um, it does take some work, but I find that it's something manageable where. I don't have to create something out of nothing. It's pre-existing. I'm just reading it, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, using my own my own voice and um, all of the works that I've you know done for narrations, they are in the public domain. 
So there isn't, you know, a, a copyright uh, issue there. Uh, you know, they're, they're free to access anywhere. Um, you know, the uh, Gutenberg, I believe it's gutenberg.org. Oh, you can yeah. find Love that. pretty much anything that was written like over a hundred years ago uh, for free in digital format. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And because I have learned from you, um, when I do something that is under copyright, I get permission. Uh, if it's a living poet and I've I've done some things with living poets that were really good poems um, And it's fun to do um, Yeah, I, I, but we share that love of language and and stuff and I think that for you it's you bring into the narration all of your life experience. I mean, it. You know, it, it it's but, but no. I mean, you understand what you're reading, and not yeah. A, yeah, a twelve year old in junior high school is not going to understand the Scarlet Letter. But well, I mean, a twelve year old shouldn't understand a Scarlet Letter. Well, you know what? I mean. it's, <laughs> it's it's a, a certain level. Twelve year old understands the Scarlet Letter. They're growing up fast. Well, they do nowadays, uh, but um, but you know what I mean. Uh, and you and I both have enough life experience that we can go back to things and revisit them and and learn new things from them. And well, go, I I love oh. rereading books. Mm -hmm. I love to reread books fairly often actually. I, I do like to read new things too, but I mean, it's the same thing with movies. I can watch the same movie a hundred times. Exactly. exactly. It's, it's funny. Um, <laughs> I, I can remember my mother saying, haven't you seen Madame Butterfly before? And I'm going, how many thousands of productions have there been of Madame Butterfly? And all of them we hope have something original to say about it so or i mean you could use the same argument to like most most people who are like how could you read that book again okay well you you listened to you know it's been a hard day's night once already why would you want to listen to it again because it's good you know, like people, yeah, don't exactly. listen, people generally don't listen to a song once in their life. It's exactly. just longer. It just I takes mean, more effort. It takes more time. Oh, God forbid we put some effort into something where it's not, you know, three to five minutes long. That's crazy talk, you know. Think about it. <laughs> exactly. I mean, uh, when you said when you made that reference, I was thinking of Proud Mary. How many interpretations have we seen of Proud Mary um, or uh, Ticket to Ride? First time I ever heard Ticket to Ride, it was by the Carpenters. I did not know at the time that um, uh, the Beatles had originated that song. Well, first time I saw that song, it was I was watching the movie Help. Oh, wow. Yeah, that was one of my first introductions to the Beatles, actually. That and the album Sgt. Pepper. That was like my first introduction as a child to the Beatles. And I mean, I was, in, I was fascinated with Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds because of the imagery, because to me, it was like Alice in Wonderland to music. Exactly. You know, exactly. just like this really whimsical kind of set of lyrics, uh, you know, newspaper taxis and, you know, looking glass ties and, you know, it just, it, it fascinated me. And then as far mm -hmm. as the movie Help, it was just so silly. I'm like, these are grown men and they're behaving in such an interestingly odd way. Um, and granted, I was single digits at the time that I first saw it and I didn't understand what was going on. It was just, they were trying to paint Ringo, poor little Ringo red and chop off his finger. I mean, uh, and when, when you're mm -hmm. single digits, you're like, what? You take, 
everything literally when you're that young, but then the more the more you live and the more you learn, then you realize you're oh, lucky. You're being deliberately spooky. Yeah, if you're lucky, you learn that not everything is is literal. Not everybody learns that, um, but that's okay too. If it works for them, usually doesn't, but they don't even realize that. Moving right along. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but loose and fancy free. Mm, exactly. Because you so say that, that a lot. You say moving right along, and I say, um, at any rate, um, <laughs> I say a lot of. Well, that's because I get off on things. these tangents, and the tangents are fun. Mm. But I, I sometimes I get back to the original train of thought. <laughs> sometimes, and sometimes I don't. the train of thought leaves the station without you. I get that too. Yeah, yeah, it's all good. And exactly, it's it's all fun. That's why I really love doing these interviews, and you know. I was talking about finding your voice a few minutes ago and you know, I'm learning that this is part of my voice, I think. And I used to do it uh, talking about myself again. Stop me, stop me when I do that because it's about you. It's not all about me. Okay, then back to me. Um, okay. <laughs> No, I used to do that a lot when I was writing you know, about peas. music. Chickpeas, I need the chicks, no peas. Let's discuss. <laughs> Thank you, Linda Simpson. I'm, I'm verklempt over here. Not You're Linda over Sim there. Linda Richmond, you know, yeah. You know, discuss. Yeah, that's funny. I just mixed up Linda Simpson, who is a crocheter we all love, and Linda Richmond, who is who you're uh, quoting. I do that a lot. I misquote things or misattribute things. Um, but anyway, about this interview thing, I, I used to do it a lot when I was writing about music more. And I really loved doing it. And I have met some lovely people and I have gained respect from people in the music world I would not have expected it from because I has words. Yeah, no. I know. Um, just the way you have the respect of everybody in the fiber world. That's a broad statement. <laughs> we could go into in several directions with that, but <laughs> I make broad statements. Let's just say that. Uh, I mean, I generalize a lot. No, I mean, I I will maintain my stance of I just do what I do. I try to do the best that I can, and I keep going. And that is, I think that's that's the biggest part of your attraction, and on top of your skills, of course, and your ability to communicate. But you are you. And that's what comes across. Yeah, you know, like it or lump it, you know. Exactly, exactly. And back I mean, to I'm, the I'm thinking thing. about the honeymooners. You know, I told her like it or lump it. You know, what happened? She lumped it. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta love Norton. You know, because he lifted Norton. up. He lifted up his hat, and there was like this big bandage on his forehead. <laughs> You, know, you like it or you lump it, you know? And the thing is, is that, I mean, what I do is not so very different from what so many others on this platform do. Um, I mean, the number of tutorials on how to make a granny square, you can't count the number of tutorials on how to make a granny square. It, you know, but the reason why See, that, that's another thing. That's another thing. When we were talking about fear, okay? Fear holding you back from wanting to do what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, initially, I was thinking, well, why would I do this when it's already been done before? And then I thought to myself, okay, well, yeah, this particular stitch or this particular who's he, what's he, do dad has already been done before, but mm -hmm. 
everybody has a different voice. Everybody has a different signature, a different way of presenting information. And sometimes it clicks and sometimes it doesn't. And everybody, like, like I was saying also before, everybody learns differently. So if everybody learns differently, and if everybody puts out information differently, it's like jigsaw puzzle pieces, okay? Sometimes, you know, you have, uh, you know, a, a tab and sometimes, sorry, you know, it'd be a tab and you have a slot, okay? Sometimes they fit, sometimes they don't, you know? And sometimes it's like, you know, you do have, you know, a tab and a slot, but they don't fit. Sometimes you have two tabs, that's definitely not gonna fit. So the thing is, is that it's a matter of the two working their way together. I might be making sense, I don't know, but no, you know, you delivery, are. System, <laughs> delivery system has a lot to do with it, you know? So the thing is, is that as far as me wanting to do what I'm doing, it's like, okay, well, I have my own verbiage. I have my own, you know, idiosyncrasies and my own flavor, if you will, uh, of how I teach things and how I Your express Your own myself. voice. Right. And so my thing is, is that, yeah, the granny square has been done a million times, but this is how I'm going to present the material. Exactly. And, and exactly, exactly. Do you find that there are things that you can do well but don't necessarily enjoy doing, so you don't really want to do them again? There are plenty of things that I would rather not do again. Um, no, I mean, um, we, we have talked about this. That's my experience with tutorials. I can do them well, but I don't need to anymore. Well, um, And I you mean, do we, tutorials remarkably well. Oh, thank you. But um, you also love to do it. Well, I mean, I I like it was stitching in and of itself. I love to do uh, tutorials are sort of the byproduct of that. Um, I would love to. I would love to love to write patterns, if only um, that that would be great. But for me. There's a big, big rift, a big gap, a big separation between creating the pattern and writing the pattern. To me, it's like stereo instructions, you know, putting together some like complex, you know, uh, doodad. Um, because it, it, it's basically in an encrypted language, if you will, you know, crochet instructions, yeah, you've got abbreviations, you have repetition, you have parentheses and asterisks and all sorts of stuff. And there is a lot of repetition involved, yes. But as far as writing it out, it's not my cup of tea. It's not. I'm and it's more into, totally my cup of tea. Well, there you, you know? go. I mean, so, my thing is, I mean, I, I can spend hours fiddling around and trying to create something new or to take something pre-existing and tweak it in such a way that it does create something new. That's how this hot mess works. Um, but as far as actually translating it into code, you know, uh, abbreviated crochet lingo, uh, you know, written word, um, that's not quite my cup of tea. I've done it. I will mm. continue to do it sporadically, but it's definitely not my strong suit. But, it, but you it's, don't it's have not my to passion. do it. Pardon? You, you, you don't have to do it, especially now that you know me. <laughs> because I love to do that sort of thing. I yeah, spent years as a business analyst um, where I was like a translator, in effect, between technology people and business people. Um, so if I write something and I learn that I have not written it clearly, it hurts me deeply because I want to do it so well. Did you know what I mean? Yeah. 
Yeah, so I mean, I, you probably you, have the same feeling. You want to do it right, of course. Yeah, you probably have the same feeling if someone gives you feedback that you were demonstrating that, and I didn't quite understand. Is that? I used to get that a lot more than I currently do. I still get that, but I used to get it a lot more, and that is why, over the past, you know, however many years, I do more repeats. I try to go slower. And yes, exactly. And I I have actually followed that model when I have tried to do my own tutorials of doing repeats, even though I'm thinking, okay, I showed you once, why do you need it more? But I'm I'm repeating just for clarification. Exactly. Because I know that's what you do. And I think that's how people learn from you. Well, the thing is, is that I used to get a, a lot more in the way of questions. Um, it's not clear. Uh, I don't understand. And that that's not on them. That's on me. Um, you know, it's on both, I think. Because well, no, if, if you I, were talking about learning styles also. If I was doing my job properly, there wouldn't be that question. It would have been nipped in the bud and it would have been made clear in the, in the delivery from the get-go. So that's on me. Um, so over the years, it's like, I'm going to do a full repeat. In fact, I might do more than one full repeat because I want it to be clear. Now, pros and cons, pros and cons. Uh, on the one hand, it leads to further clarity, which is good. On the other hand, it takes something that could potentially be taught in less than a half hour to something that turns into a multi-part tutorial series, each one being like, you know, 45 minutes long. Um, it's clear, but it's much more uh, stretched out, if you will, than it might otherwise be need to be uh, done. So I often say this, it's like at the risk of being, mon uh, uh, not mundane, um, Verbose? Well, ver you know, at the risk of being verbose or the risk of being, uh, uh, you know, too repetitive or boring or what redundant. have you. Thank you. That's the word, redundant. At the risk of being redundant, you know, I'm going to do this repeat again, but it's just for the sake of clarity. Um, so there, there is a fine line and it, it's, am I being clear enough or am I just being plain boring? Um, again, what I was saying before about you can't please everybody and you can try, but it's probably not going to have the desired results where the more you, the more people you try to please, the less likely you are to please yourself. You know, you're going to drive yourself crazy trying to please everybody. So I try to have a delicate balance and I try to walk that delicate line between the two being thorough but not being redundant. It's tricky. Well, I, I don't think anyone that I know would say that you don't do it well, um, because I think you do. And I know that long before we ever met personally, well, we still haven't met personally, but you know what I mean? Um, I was learning from your tutorials. Um, I was gonna go somewhere with that. Once again, that train. I missed the train. Pretty much missed the station, actually. But <laughs> um, so, what is what does the future hold for Fiber Spider? No idea. Absolutely no clue. <laughs> well, what kind of spidey dreams do you have? Spidey dreams. That's a good question. I mean, there there are lots of things that I would love to happen in my life. Now, probable versus possible. Th again, it's that fear different. thing again. Don't start. <laughs> Don't start with me. I'll come over there. Um, <laughs> Don't make. Don't make me stop the car. I know. Don't make me pull this car over. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, 
No, I mean, there, there are plenty of things that I would like to have happen in my life. Um, I would love to, you know, I, I've made this no secret. Yeah, I live with my mom. Um, I, I would love to be a adult and move out and so on and so forth. I mean, financially, it's just not viable. Um, but, uh, you know, yeah, I would love to live on my own or, you know, with somebody special, nobody particular in mind, you know, I mean, what, we're not going there. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that would all be nice. I mean, I'm not dreaming of like a wh white picket fence or anything like that, but no, just, just to have a place of my own, that would be really nice. Um, as far as, you know, realisticness versus dreams. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, there are certain things that I think would be really awesome. Like if I could live in some sort of artist commune type of situation, you know, that I, yeah, so that would cool. be, yeah, I mean, that would be great where it's like, you know, uh, you have all these creative types, you know, living together and so forth. Yeah, that would be great. You know, like you have somebody who does pottery and somebody who does weaving and somebody who does spinning and somebody who does dying and somebody you know like all these different artisan types living together yeah that would be cool but it's been a long time since the 60s so um i don't necessarily see that you know happening in a realistic fashion but yeah something like that would be nice or uh having my own boutique somewhere, you know, yeah, that would be cool, but I don't know much of anything about running an actual business. Um, I mean, yeah, I have an Etsy store, um, which has been doing relatively well, but it's not brick and mortar. I don't know anything about running a brick and mortar store. Um, I will Allow probably... me to digress. The, the link to your Etsy store and everything else will be in the description when we're done. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, it would be nice to have an actual store. Uh, unfortunately, me with my yarn addiction habit, like I don't know if I would be able to differentiate between stock and stash. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's when, probably like me trying to run a liquor store. <laughs> I mean, when, when I worked at a Michael's years mm -hmm. ago, rare was the day that I didn't go home with something. Most of my paycheck went to buying yarn, you know, between yarn and jewelry making supplies. Cause that's something I did quite a bit, um, you know, making jewelry and so forth. And I haven't done that since I started the channel really. Um, yeah. Cause I don't ever, recall you're ever mentioning that to me either. The, I, I mean, the, you, you've told me stories about working in Michael's, but I'm not sure that you've mentioned the jewelry making, but then yeah, I have a I, mind like a sieve, so I don't know. I've made, um, you know, necklaces and bracelets and rings and, and so forth um, in a rudimentary way. I mean, we're not talking like, you know, firing up a forge or anything. Um, but Is that uh, something I, you see yourself picking up again, or do you think you've done enough of it? I could, you know, because I mean, that has a lot of possibilities in and of itself. Um, I used to work a lot with polymer clay, uh, making my own beads and pendants and that sort of thing. And that was a lot of fun. Um, we have mutual friends who do polymer clay handles for your standard, you know, aluminum crochet hooks. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they do good business doing it and they're beautiful. Um, that's not something I myself know how to do. Well, I mean, I've done it using scrap clay and it doesn't look very nice, but it, it does have the same sort of, you know, grip as like an ergonomic hook, which is nice. Um, it's very simple um, in the grand scheme of things, but if you want it to mm -hmm. actually look nice, that takes some more effort naturally. Yeah, exactly. Um, but no, I mean, I also used to do uh, chain mail jewelry as well. Um, oh, that's cool. Yeah, making little itty bitty tiny rings, little tiny jump rings uh, out of uh, wire and then linking them all together with, uh, you know, pliers and so forth. I would make chain necklaces 
and um, all sorts of That's things like that. That's a lot of work and very intense and requires a heck of a lot of concentration, right? And, but also it's mindless tedium, mm. which I, I grew Well, on. sometimes you need that too. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I used to do that. Um, and it was, it was a lot of fun. Could I see going back to that? Eh, maybe at some point, but I mean, really stitching has pretty much taken over for mm. the most part. Um, but um, yeah, so when I worked at Michael's, yeah, I mean, rare was the day when I didn't go home with some yarn or some jewelry making supplies. Um, so the idea of me running a store that's a craft store, that might not be a good idea. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, no, I mean, the, the Etsy store has been doing actually pretty well because I've actually been putting stock into the store. I've been trying to get rid of things that I've had for a while, putting those Finished up objects, them. you mean? Yes, of course, yes. Yeah, because I... I... I cannot sell a finished object to save my life, honestly. Cannot uh, or will not? Cannot, because every time I try, it just doesn't work out. If I, if I try to do some sort of a sales event, like a, a craft fair or something, I wind up talking with old ladies who want to tell me their crochet stories. And I love that, but it's not, um, it's not selling stuff. Well, um, see, that's why Etsy is good. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've done craft fairs before. Pros and cons to craft fairs. Okay. I mean, do you have a while? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've got all night. I mean, with, with craft fairs, um, it's potentially a great way of getting rid of a lot of your stock. Unfortunately, people who don't stitch who don't realize the amount of actual work that goes into what we do, they do not value necessarily what we do. They want I Walmart mean, like, prices. Well, I mean, like for instance, I've had fellow stitchers commission me to make something and buy something from me that they could totally make themselves, okay? They, they're totally capable of doing it, but they would pay me more because they from experience know what goes into it they don't feel mm -hmm. like making the item they just want to buy it but the thing is they would be willing to pay me more because they know firsthand what goes into it i remember at one craft fair i did in fact i think it might have been one of the last ones that i did where i had it was a crocheted baby blanket you know several feet by several feet baby blanket that was crocheted I think it was priced, I think I might have had it priced at that time for like $30. Reasonable. And they were trying to haggle me down. I was irked. I would have been as well. I was irked because <clears throat> I, mean, I was already knocking my prices down because I was at that point more interested in getting rid of a lot of stuff because I had accumulated mm -hmm. a lot of exactly. stuff. Okay. And I was more interested in clearing out. At one point, um, I had so much and I just wanted to do like a one clean fell swoop. Now this was many years ago where I was selling um, hats and scarves, two for 20 back in the day, okay? And they were haggling me on that. I'm like, I'm not even making back materials at that rate, you know, I was, at, I was, like I said, I was at that point where I'm like, I just have to get rid of stuff. Mm -hmm. I had bins upon bins upon bins, bins of, of just tons of stuff and I needed to get rid of stuff. So for me, it was like a, a clearance, if you will. Exactly. And they still didn't see the amount of work that went in. So on the one hand, yeah, it's a great way of getting rid of stuff, but you are not necessarily going to get the you know, the, the, the value for your work, unfortunately. Exactly. Exactly. Also, I'm thinking I venue, should send you some of my stuff to sell for me. Cause the, I can't the venue do it. Also, the venue also has a lot to do with it. There are mm. you know, location, location, location. Yeah. That has a lot to do with it. Um, I mean, out of all of the 
venues that I've done, I've never lost money um, because you have to pay to have the, the space. To be there, yeah. yeah. Um, and so if I can make back the, the price of the space and make some money also, then I'm like, okay, it's a win. And I've never lost money, but sometimes I've done better than others. Um, and of course, also you have to sit there all day. And if you need to use the restroom, you need to have somebody watch your stuff. And your so money best, box. You know, it's, it's best to go with a friend and, mm -hmm. you know, you, you take turns. Um, you have to keep an eye on your stock that something doesn't grow legs and walk away. Fortunately, I don't think that that's happened to me. Not that I know mm -hmm. of. There, there are a lot of ins and outs and a lot of things to do with that. Um, and, uh, you know, but also it's a great way of getting your name out there, at least on a local level. Um, so that, that's an advantage. Me personally, though, my experience with Etsy has been pretty good. You know, I, I really don't have many complaints. Some people, they have issue with some of the policies in place. I can understand why, but for me, at the level that I'm doing it, I really don't have an issue with it. Um, I think that's probably that. true of every um, um, online outlet. Because I know people do have issues with Ravelry as well. Mm. Um, but um, you, you were making me think of the first time I ever did a craft fair uh, or craft bazaar or whatever you want to call it. I called it a disaster. Um, I, I priced my stuff comparable to what I had seen on Etsy. So with that, I took like a thousands of dollars worth of stuff with me. And I walked away, I think I sold less than $100 of stuff. And then I had to take it back home. Mm -hmm. um, but, but again, you were talking about location. That was a, a place that wasn't going to get the, uh, the walk-in traffic or the drive-by traffic. The clientele, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, the, I've, the I've done all sorts of venues. I mean, you know, I've, I've done um, also the, the closer to the holidays, the better. Mm -hmm. Because you have last minute shoppers who are like desperate to find that perfect gift for somebody. Um, you know, that, that definitely helps. If it's in the summer and you're selling crocheted stuff, good luck. I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Getting back to the holidays though, last year, um, a cousin uh, offered me money to make like a pair of crochet slippers. And I said, oh no, I'll make it a gift for Christmas. I, I fully expecting her to say, no, let me pay you something. She didn't. Careful mm -hmm. what you say, because people I can know. run with it. I know. I, I, and you know, it's, it, it's a funny story, but I don't really resent it much. <laughs> I'm I'm not really rolling in money. And I know well, you're not am either. I. Yeah. Neither am I. Well, I mean, as far as commissions, I mean, I I used to do a lot of those. Before YouTube, I did a lot of commission work. And right now, no. Oh, yeah. In your no. position, I wouldn't either. No, I don't. Um Although I, I would also think that your name would make anything that you make more valuable, but you then also have your brand to defend and you also have to do business with people and people suck. Well, you know, they, okay. People can, it's not that people do, people can suck, you know, but it, you can't do, you can't have a generalized blanket statement like that. Um, sure, I can. It's my channel. <laughs> you do you, boo. Um, but uh, no, the thing is, I used to do a lot of commissions because um, many moons ago, yeah, I used to work at a, a blockbuster video and they folded, you know, back in 2009. That's funny because I remember 
this was back in the 90s when I lived in Chelsea in Manhattan, walking a block to go to the Blockbuster and rent VHS tapes. I used to too. You know, um, be kind, rewind. But yeah, I mean, I used to work. I I worked with Blockbuster for like ten years, uh -huh. and then they they folded, and you know, I was unemployed for a while, and to make extra money, you know, I took commissions. You know, I was making stuff left, right, and center. Um, actually, at that time, it was mostly Ami Gurumi. Actually, yeah. Do you like doing Ami Gurumi? It has its moments, you know, uh, it, it does have some, you know, fun elements to it. And I mean, I was making everything from turtles to rabbits, bears. Um, uh, somebody commissioned me to make a hedgehog with a mohawk. Um, well, that sounds cute. It, you know, I what, once... no, no, guinea pig. It was a guinea pig uh, with a okay, mohawk. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, frogs, pigs, you name it. And uh, it, was, it was a great learning experience for me as far as learning how to manipulate the stitches in such a way. Because again, I wasn't working with patterns or books, I was winging it. But if you can do a single crochet stitch, and if you can do an increase and a decrease, you can do amigurumi. I mean, that's mm -hmm. really what it boils down to. Um, but yeah, so I was making extra money by doing commissions um, at that time and I mean, I was at Michael's a lot getting supplies for materials. And then one of the workers is like, wait a minute, you crochet? I'm like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And she's like, are you looking for a job? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and there you go. Um, and uh, the Suddenly rest. you had a job. Yeah. yeah the rest is history. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, but oddly enough, no, I didn't work in the yarn department. No, no, no. I was working uh, a lot, mostly actually in the jewelry department because they didn't have anybody to work in that department. And, oh, and you knew something about it. Well, that's the thing. I didn't know Jack about making jewelry. But you but learned needed, quick, didn't well, you? That's the thing. See, the thing is, is that at that time it was uh, seasonal. You know, it was around you know Christmas time, and they were really in need of extra people. And then, after the holidays were over, you know, I still wanted to have a job, and uh, they're like, "Well, are you interested in working?" You know, like you know, the focus of your work would be in the jewelry department. You know, like stocking and so on and so forth in that department. And I'm like, "Why well, really don't know anything about jewelry?" Um, but I can learn. And the thing is, is that being exposed to all of these findings and uh, clasps and, okay, I have something on my fingers and I have no idea what this is. I think I, I, I think I was uh, balling yarn where the, uh, the dye came off oh, of my fingers. because you were winding a ball when we were first Yeah, speaking. I think that might have oh, what happened. At any that rate. That happens, yeah. Um, so, cause I'm like, why, why am I, why am I blue? Um, so uh don't make me start saying it no i won't no no um so the thing is is that uh working with all of the findings and the the beads and so on and so forth i'm like ooh, i could do this and i could pair this with this and so on and so forth and before you know it um i i was making a lot of stuff and the thing is is that since i was in that department for hours upon hours People, they come to that department and they have questions. Well, what's, how do you answer said questions? You need to have experience. So I was very much self-taught on how to do jewelry making. And at one point I was doing some classes there and so on and so forth um, on jewelry making. But um, crocheting and knitting has always really been my jam. You know, I mean, that's really... That, that was always my mainstay. But in a job like that, you you do what you're asked to do and you go where you're told to go. So there you go. I've worked in convenience stores. I know that experience. Yeah. So yeah. And then <laughs> I made donuts on midnight shift once. And actually it was, it wasn't bad. And I 
became a pretty good donut maker too. But that's just an experience and you do what you have to do. Because mm -hmm. I needed a job and that was there. Anyway, I hate to do this, but we've been at it for over an hour. So we have to probably come to a close. What would you like to leave people with? Um, you always throw these curveballs at me. <laughs> That's my business. Well, um, you know, basic nutshell, you know, um, if you haven't seen my channel already, uh, you know, which I cannot imagine, but I, go ahead. There are people, go ahead. I'm sorry. You I never know. I assume nothing, you know, but no, my, my channel is fiber spider on YouTube. Um, it's a lot of fun, at least I think so. You know, crocheting, knitting, mm -hmm. uh, tutorials for the most part, audiobook narrations. And then, of course, I, as David was saying, um, I do have a secondary YouTube channel, uh, which is Fiber Spider Games. And that one, I'm I'm playing video games, and you you don't see my 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 face, but you do hear my voice because I'm basically commenting on my my gameplay. Uh, as I'm filming, and I think it's a lot of fun. I usually have a variety of different games that I cycle through. Some are cute, some are creepy. Um, uh, compared to some YouTubers, I would say my playing style is rubbish. Uh, I am not very good, but what I lack in skill and talent, I make up for with persistence. <laughs> and I, I think you sent me uh, uh, a game that you wanted me to experience and I think it was sort of yarny right uh, uh, well, a particular there, there, game. Is, yeah. there is one um, it's uh, there's actually a couple of sort of crafty arty type games one of them yes it's called unravel I believe yeah yeah it is adorable it was, um, it was, it but it was like two o'clock in the morning when you sent it to me and I'm going maybe later because I, I got started with it and then I fell asleep. You know, you're this, you're this little, your little guy made out of yarn and you have these little adventures and it's really cute. I've um, never been called that before. <laughs> and there was a sequel to it actually. Oh um, yeah? Yeah, that was also rather adorable. Um, and then uh, there's there's actually a, a bunch of more artsy uh, type games that I've done playthroughs on. But, you know, anything from, you know, zombie apocalypses to, um, you know, uh, fantasy, you know, all, all sorts of games. Um, but the, another thing that I wanted to uh, touch upon is that you know, yeah, I may not be a very good gamer, but I have a lot of fun. And I post daily on that channel, usually anywhere from half an hour to an hour, you know, uh, per video. And also, unlike uh, a lot of YouTubers, I don't use any profanity. Um, and How do you manage I'm, that? It's hard. It takes work and effort sometimes when you get frustrated or when you're having a very scared moment but i do my darndest not to use any profanity i say some other interesting words you know uh in in well, lieu in in yeah. lieu of you know that but um i want my channel to be appropriate for everybody uh the now the, the video games themselves may not be um, you know, because, you know, sometimes you have the video game characters who are swearing up a storm and doing all sorts of craziness. But me personally, my mm -hmm. side of the street is clean. You know, that's me. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm only accountable for myself. You know, I can't help it if a, you know, a character in the game is swearing like a truck driver. Um, you know, no, no aspersions on truck drivers, mind you. Um, but, we have uh, some truck drivers in the crochet community, actually. I, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, you know, you got a lot of downtime in between. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, no, I, so I have that channel. Uh, I have my main channel. So it's Fiber Spider and then Fiber Spider Games. 
And then of course, as David was saying, yes, I do have my Etsy store, um, which is under Fiber Spider. Um, that's pretty much it, you know? Um, but yeah, I'm, I try to post, I would say on average, uh, three times a week, sometimes four times a week on my main channel and seven days a week on my gaming channel. Look, that's cool. that's cool. the nutshell. Well, this has been a delight and I want to thank you so much has, for joining me. And I want to thank everybody who has, um, been with us through this entire interview, or even if you have just fast forwarded, uh, thank you for joining us anyway. And as I always say, I have to lean in the right way. Subscribe. <laughs> Yeah. Like, it, I, I've been doing the same thing because like when I'm like going like this, I'm like, okay, which way am I actually going? Because exactly. Everything yeah. is reversed. I know exactly what you're talking about. I get it. Yeah. Like, subscribe, comment, share all the standard YouTube crap. Definitely. And keep coming back. And, uh, and I'm going to click end now.